going to take the north and never give it back. So that's a good pick. You get the corner. I got to go bold, right? I got to go bold for this. Oh, yeah. She's got some nice. Welcome back to the Unbearable Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Barron. And make sure to like and subscribe out there on YouTube. And always, always rate the show five stars out there everywhere that you get your podcast. Just search for Unbearable Sports. Happy Friday. Happy weekend. One more weekend until we hit the 4th of July, but also training camp is getting so close and you want to stay tuned here. I'll be, I'll be going over to training camp and also covering it like we did last season. So we will keep you covered. And also we're going to be breaking down our camp countdowns with our player position profiles, where we talk about practically everybody on the bears and really break it down. Did we get better at a position group from this year to next to this current season and really break down the progression with the different players, not just they, Oh, we like this, but who should get better? Who should regress and really talk about this objectively. Speaking about talking objectively today, we're going to be talking about, we did our optimism show. And if you have not seen the optimism show, listen to that first, because we talk about five reasons to be optimistic about the bears heading into 2024. And today we're kind of taking the opposite approach. Now, you could say it's a pessimistic show. I like to think of it more of, I'm not just being a Debbie Downer with this. It's more so talking about what what questions do we still have going into this year that we hopefully see the Bears address. Hopefully they prove us wrong with some of these pieces, but just some questions that I want to bring up and also just kind of shine the light on a couple things that maybe we have too many much expectations for individuals and other pieces like that that I want to talk about. So let me know down below in the comments if you're watching on YouTube, what are you maybe a little bit concerned about with the Bears heading into 2024 that you hope they address or they do something that makes you feel a little bit better heading into this season. So today we got to start out with number one and it's I, I wanted to do this because it was also the first thing that we talked about last time. And I want to address the whole conversation about a rookie quarterback and kind of fixing expectations on a quarterback. So I wanted to ask everyone this question and think about it to yourself or comment down below. When you think of a successful season for, Ju- for I was going to say Justin Fields, for Caleb Williams, what does that look like? Or who do you want them to play like because Aaron Schatz, an ESPN writer, he ranked the top 12 or top 22 different rookie quarterback seasons. And the way that he put it was Dak Prescott was number one. Russell Wilson was number two. CJ Stroud was number three. Roethlisberger four. RG three, number five. Matt Ryan, six. Cam Newton, seven. Uh, Justin Herbert, number eight, right? These are some good name quarterbacks to have out there. When you put stats to it, and I know a lot of people care about the stats, but to me, I don't think we need to care about that. It just does Caleb look like the guy. But if we want to put a stat number to it, what's success like? Is it 4,000 yards? Is it 3,800 yards? If you think about it, the Bears' all-time leading passer in a single season was 3,830 yards. And if you're like, well, I just want to be better than Jordan Love, Jordan Love had 4,159 which was top 10 in the NFL. Also 32 touchdowns and 11 interceptions. Now, how does that stack up? And also Bears 29 touchdowns is the passing touchdowns record. Now, how does that look like to other rookie quarterbacks? So let's talk about the rookie quarterbacks because obviously Caleb Williams, this is not really against Caleb Williams. This is more about how rookie quarterbacks perform. And if you look, I have a, for those watching, you can see this table of rookie quarterbacks. What have they typically done throughout their career? And if you look at this, the all-time leading passer for yards for a rookie quarterback was Andrew Luck back in 2012 with 4,374 uh, passing yards and also 23 touchdowns and 18 interceptions. Is that successful? Yeah, that's a 78 quarterback or 76 quarterback rating. Not great because obviously the 18 interceptions because he didn't really have a good team around him. He was just kind of slinging the rock. Herbert, 4,336 passing yards, 
31 touchdowns, 10 interceptions. So, you know, sign me up to that. And C.J. Stroud, 4,108 yards, 23 touchdowns, and 5 interceptions in 15 games. Obviously, we all want the C.J. Stroud, the Justin Herbert performance. And that, to me, would be totally fine. But I think when you see even like Aaron Schatz's article about Dak Prescott having, in his opinion, the most impressive rookie season, I think when you look at then Dak Prescott's numbers, what did he have? 3,667 passing yards, 23 touchdowns, and four interceptions. More of a game manager, which I don't really think that we're going to see that out of Caleb Williams. But the reason why I wanted to bring up these stats is to just kind of demonstrate and show where should he be? Should he be throwing for 4,000 yards? Should he not be throwing for 4,000 yards? And you look at the top passers. Only 10 quarterbacks last season threw for over 4,000 yards. And that's something that, with this one, it's more of leveling the expectation of, well, how good would he be? And to me, I want to see that 4,000 yards. But we also have to treat it like if he throws for 4,000 yards, dang. Because you look at historically, you're talking about what? One, two, three, four, five quarterbacks, five rookie quarterbacks have thrown for over 4,000 yards. Jameis, Cam, Cam. C.J. Stroud, Justin Herbert, and Andrew Luck. It'd be rare company, but to me, I, I, I like it. I like it, right? But I wanted to throw this out there as not like a like I said, this isn't about pessimism. This is more about just what can we expect and leveling expectations, but also bringing up some concerns with the team. And this not necessarily a concern, more so that what do I think that Caleb Williams will do? Well, if he throws for 3,800 yards and like my whole bar is just try and beat the Bears rookie records. I mean, not rookie records, the actual quarterback record. 3,800, I think that's a perfect target. And you look at who's been around that area from rookie quarterbacks, it would still be a top five or you'd be number six in passing yards if he broke the Bears passing yards record. So it's something that definitely to keep in mind because even though we have all these weapons, the ball there's only so many yards that he can actually throw for, and are they going to lean on the running game a little bit more this season? So we'll talk about that spoiler alert a little bit later. So let's talk about number two. What is the second piece that I want to talk about? And it's kind of obvious. Talking about the rookie quarterbacks, number two for me is the offensive line health because this is more of a concern and. I think that everyone feels this way. The offensive line is, I actually think, and I'll dare say this, when you look at this offensive line, if you had the magic Madden setting and you shut off the injuries, how good is this offensive line? And personally, I think that this is then the solid offensive line. Not going to say that this is one of the best, but you think about it, I think Braxton Jones and Darnell Wright are two good tackles. And I think that, When you look at the interior of the line, Nate Davis was banged up last season, and you also have Tevin Jenkins. When healthy, is one of the best guards in the NFL, and then you go, okay, well, if Coleman Shelton is starting for you, that's a below average center, right? So you feel good, at least, about the offensive line, but when you factor in the the injuries, you factor in someone getting hurt, and we are already starting to see this. Braxton Jones came off of a neck injury last season, and I still, even though I'm a big Braxton Jones supporter, I felt like he wasn't moving as fluidly as he did in his rookie season, where he was just flying to the ball, flying to people, and just smacking them in the face. Loved, absolutely loved it. Then you go to the interior. Tevin Jenkins had to sit out a little bit already. Nate Davis had to sit out. I don't even think he's played and participated in a full practice yet. And then you go, okay, now what has to happen? And the reason why this is such a concern is there is a huge drop-off between a starting caliber offensive lineman and a backup caliber offensive lineman. And also, when you look at this interior of the offensive line, you have the competition between Ryan Bates and Coleman Shelton. All indicators pointed that the Bears liked Ryan Bates if he could be their center. Now they're having an open competition as, and actually I shouldn't even put that in quotes. They are having a competition at center, but part of me is thinking too, is this because of the health of the guards as well? Because 
if you can't count on Nate Davis and you can't count on Tevin Jenkins to be healthy, I would rather have Coleman Shelton starting, even though I did say he's a below average center in this in this league. But Ryan Bates is kind of the unknown commodity at the center position, but we do know that he's a good backup guard. And if you have questions at the inj- at the guard spots when it comes to health, that's where I say, do you really, if you want your best five offensive linemen out there, Ryan Bates playing guard is one of your best players or one of your best five offensive linemen that are out there. And the reason too, why that's a little bit down is because when you have a rookie quarterback like a Caleb Williams, you want to make sure that him and his center have a good chemistry. They understand where everything's at. He understands the protections. So you want to make sure that rookie quarterback and that center are on the same page. So that's where the health of this offensive line, you want it to be healthy and already they were starting to show signs of that. So please, when it comes down to training camp, I really hope that we're talking a different story. So I'll believe it when I see it, but hopefully, hopefully we're not talking about, okay, Nate Davis was out day one, right? I'm, I'm hoping I'm not reporting that day one. So we will see, but let's talk about the next kind of concern. And this is a depressing show, but no, we're talking about this. The one other concern that I, ha- another concern that I have about the Bears is, like everyone else, the defensive line, and we everyone's talked about this. The defensive line is definitely a concern because we need, it, like, you look at the back seven. I already told, I already said this, right? The back seven to me is something that's very, very talented and full of good playmakers. But when you talk about the front four, where you have to de- generate some pressure, they can only cover people for so long. You have to generate pressure. And then when you look at who they have at the defensive line, you're hoping Javon Dexter can get better. And to be optimistic about it, he did look a lot better towards the end of the season. But it does feel like you're kind of shifting your defensive line up because Justin Jones, even though I'm not the biggest fan of him, he still had, he was still second in the team in pressures. You really do need Javon to kind of step up, Pickens to kind of take up the old Javon Dexter role. And then you need someone like a Byron Cowart or a Michael Dwarmafor to play that fourth defensive tackle role. And then also, opposite Montez Sweat. Who is going to help out Montez Sweat? Because Montez Sweat is a great player. Would I dare call him like elite, that kind of Hall of Fame type of player? No. I don't I think that if you were going to put Montez Sweat in a Hall of Fame conversation, you'd you're kind of out, way out there with it. Montez Sweat is a very good player. And I think if you put the amount on his plate that like a Khalil Mack had when he came in, that is unrealistic and unfair to Montez Sweat. Montez Sweat is an elite run defender and a really, really good foundational pass rusher. He just had a career year last season. So to me, you need help on that opposite side. And to Marcus Walker, who I've always said, better interior player than exterior Good defensive end number three, but we need someone to step up as that number two. And we talked about the free agency. I still feel like they're going to sign someone, most likely um, Yannick Ngakwe, but we'll have to see. Maybe Carl Lawson. I think it all depends on the injuries with him. Um, And then there's a couple other. Emmanuel Agba, he wants to play more in a 4-3, so he could be another option at that defensive end. But still then, I'm not super, super in love, and you're really putting a lot on Jervon Dexter coming into that second season. Like he really needs a breakout year to really, really make this defensive line, make you feel better about this defensive line overall. But then number four, kind of building on top of this defense is the whole mentality of this being a top five defense. I feel very comfortable about the secondary, very comfortable about the linebackers. This is easily a top five linebacker unit. And I think with the secondary, a lot of them can take steps up to be one of the top units that are out there. But I know a lot of people have brought up the last handful of games that they had where the defense was dominating. Now, they turned over the ball a lot. And something that they've shown is that historically, turnovers are difficult to predict. A lot of times when you have a lot of turnovers, it doesn't mean you're going to guarantee those turnovers next season, especially when you're not getting a lot of pressure on the quarterback, they're not hurrying the throws. So to me, that's where some of the concerns do come in. 
I think that this is a really good defense. And I just kind of pump the brakes a little bit on this whole top five. Prove me wrong. And hey, if Javon Dexter looks like the second coming of Tommy Harris, then yeah, I think that this could be a top five defense because now you have your three technique and now you have your defensive ends and now you have your linebackers and your secondary. And now you just need, okay, Yannick Ngakwe coming on third downs, Austin Booker coming on third downs, and you feel a little bit better. And to be honest with Austin Booker, he wasn't a starter in college and I loved him coming out. He just needs a year. He really does just need a year. I still think he's going to be productive, but they're going to put him in the best position to succeed, which is more of a third down pass rusher, not just throw him into the fire like they did with Dominique Robinson. So top five defense. I just want to kind of pump the brakes a little bit on that. And hey, this defensive line, and it's mainly because of that defensive line. Let's kind of keep that like that defensive line does need to step up. And hey, Jalen Johnson came off a career year. Same thing with Montez Sweat. That's where you might expect some just natural regression. Not saying they got worse, but just that's how seasons work, right? After a career year, you typically just, okay, kind of even out where you're at. So that's something where with the defense, I do have a little bit of a question on it. Um, the defensive line needs to step up in, in a big way in order for this to become a top five defense in the NFL. And my last piece, this is going to be interesting. And some of you might scratch your head with this, but I want to, I actually have a question and I don't want to say a concern. It's it's, it is just generally more of a question. And that's actually with this running game. Now I already, I already heard you gasp out there, right? Why did Brad bring up the running game? Well, think about it. I think that we're going to have some natural regression because we've always been like the number one running attack. And what has been a huge factor inside of the running game? We no longer have Justin Fields. We're not going to be running the football like we did with Fields. Uh, hopefully with the franchise quarterback with Caleb Williams. So you're not going to have that threat anymore. You're not going to have those crazy yards. And to be honest, we all know that Justin Fields was one of the best running quarterbacks of all time. We saw that. So with the running game, you're now going to be more focused on the actual running backs. Caleb probably will still run, but he's not going to be used like a triple option quarterback like we saw last season with Luke Getze's offense. So because of that, do you see less success out of the running game? Well, this is where some of the optimism comes in. When you saw Tyson Bajan out there, at least, the running game was still going well, it's still going strong. But I do have a question about the scheme. We saw, and we saw when Luke Getze took over, remember how bad this running attack was under Matt Nagy, and Luke Getze comes in with a lot of the same players, but just comes in with a different scheme and runs them, runs the ball very well and phenomenally. No matter what run defense we were going against, even before they started just running it like crazy with Justin Fields, it always felt like this running attack was going to do something. They were going to do something and put up some good yards. So now when you don't have a, what when you swap out your offensive coordinator, and yes, I know people hate Luke Getze, but his running game was very nice. And you hear people talk about with um, Shane Waldron at, with Seattle, they were saying, hey, he doesn't run it enough. And the running game wasn't as successful as they wanted. So that's why I do have a question about this. I don't think it's just a slam dunk. Hey, yo, we... We were the best last year. We're just going to be the best again because we got a running back that we paid a lot of money to, right? That's not how it works. <laughs> that's, that's really not how it works. And that's why I wanted to bring this up because yes, we got a better running back, but it's about, it's much more than just the running back. It's about the scheme. It's about the system around it. It's about the quarterback being a threat and always taking one player with them. So that's why the running game just want to see it. I want to see it operate because I we saw what happened with John Fox. John Fox, good running game. All of a sudden, Matt Nagy comes in and we can't run for three and a half yards a carry. I don't think it's going to be that bad. Nothing was worse than Matt Nagy's running attack. But it's something that I just I want to bring up because with the shifting around with some of the offensive line, with the new system, you just want to make sure that they all work together and they just keep that going. This is going to be a question just overall because you want this running game to be good for your quarterback. So, like I said, 
let me know down below. Congratulations, you made it through five pe five reasons for pessimism with the Chicago Bears or questions that I still have out there. But yeah, if you like it, make sure to like it, subscribe, especially since you watched all the way through. Because now what we're going to be going through, camp breakdowns. With the camp countdowns, when we start going through all the different players on the Chicago Bears, some of my favorite stuff that we do. So if you have not been a part of this, you, I, I can't wait to show you what we got because we do phenomenal breakdowns with this. So make sure to like and subscribe out there. Rate the show five stars. And with that, have a great weekend in Unbearable Sports Podcast. We are out. Yeah, she's got some nice long hair and you know